Good morning, church. It is my pleasure to welcome you this morning. For us sitting here in the sanctuary and for our community online, welcome. Today is our community Sunday. So we have the traditional service taking place in Warner Hall. And we have the children meeting separately right there at Forest Church. Wishing you a great experience today as you come to the presence of your maker. Juliana, what, have you been, what are you waiting for? Hmm. I'm waiting for opportunity to meet my daughter that I have not seen for a while. I also have my calendar marked to see a friend that I've not seen for over 10 years. So that's what you're waiting for. Sounds like, yeah, thank you. And church family here, if you've got loud voices, and I say to you this morning, what are you waiting for? Does anyone want to put up their hand and shout loudly? Oh, right, Becky and Sophia, what are you waiting for? Baby Flashman paying to all the porn. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else can top that? <laughs> Anyone? Anyone else waiting for something? Yeah, Russ. House move. House move. Okay, you're waiting for a house move. Right. Thank you. So um, I'm just going to show you a picture, two pictures actually, that are going to come up on the screen. So this is Winston. Some of you know Winston and some of you don't. He's our dog. And I, I watch him and he watches me. And what I saw last Saturday, because obviously since, since lockdown we've been able to have people back in our home. And last Saturday in particular, I was thinking about watching and waiting. And he was obviously watching me because I got the hoover out. I started to wash up the dishes in the kitchen and I turned the oven on. And Dan, can I have the next slide, please? So he thought it was time for him to go and watch and wait at the windowsill, which looks out onto our roundabout, because he saw by what I was doing that I was getting ready for a visitor. And he was right. Duncan's sister was coming for lunch. So he looked, he was attentive to what I was doing. He was noticing and he was anticipating. And Juliana's just going to tell us a little bit about Advent to refresh our minds from last year. Thank you, Dillis. In Advent, I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Are you waiting to receive anything from God? Are you waiting to be inspired by the Holy Spirit? Are you anticipating God's visitation? Just take a moment. Think, what are you waiting to receive from the Lord? Be confident, assured, and enthusiastic about the love of Jesus. As we prepare to celebrate Christmas, what are your thoughts about connecting with God, about holding on to Him, about depending on Him? What about His second coming? 
be prepared. God bless you. If you're able to, would you like to stand? And I'm going to pray. So we've just thought about what are we waiting for? Are our hearts stirred? Are they warmed? Are they expectant? For Jesus to come and to be remembered this Christmas as we celebrate his life, as he's born. And also, are we prepared for the second coming, his return? Just spend a moment to position yourselves, to get yourselves ready as we come to worship. Let go of anything that hinders you. You may want to put your hands out, open to receive Christ afresh this morning. Open for him to come and meet you the living God, the holy God, the God that came to us in Jesus Christ. So we come, Lord, to worship. We come and ask that you would meet us here. Poor as we are, frail as we are, would you come by your Holy Spirit? And may we be free to praise you this morning because you love to hear us sing your praises. Amen. Oh, you are 
shout out a few of the reasons why God is great. Perhaps there's names for God. Perhaps things you're thankful for. And we'll sing Great is the Lord in a summary response. So just please feel free, speak loud and clear. God, you are great. Great is the Lord. Please sit down. You're going to get like with the candle. So today is the first Sunday in Advent, and Juliana is going to light the first candle, which is hope. This is the candle of hope with Christians around the world. We use this light to help us prepare our hearts and minds for the coming of God's Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We may receive God's light as we hear the words of the prophet Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness 
have seen a great light. Those who lived in the land of deep darkness, on them the light has shined. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. Let us pray. Lord, as we look to the birth of Jesus, grant that the light of your love for us will help us to become lights in the lives of those around us. Prepare our hearts for the joy and gladness of your coming. For Jesus is our hope. Amen. Amen. It's now time to look at the notices. So um, over to our wonderful team. This is what's coming up in the next week. And after the notices, we will go back into a time of led prayer by Juliana. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord, for the hope we have in you. Thank you for our lives. We are grateful for our world. Forgive us our sins and wrongdoing. Help us forgive those who have sinned against us. Help us extend the love of Jesus to those around us. Let those who are in very difficult situation find the help that they need. Father, we pray for wisdom for leaders of all nations of the world to manage the migrant complex situation. We specifically pray concerning the situation in Europe as regards the crossing of the English Channel. Mm. Let there be understanding and cooperation among allies so that there can be lasting solutions to this crisis. We pray for peace in our world, Lord. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on the homeland of refugees. Touch the leaders of these nations so that they have courage to build a decent and safe society for their citizens. Father, help the conflict and crisis situation in nations like Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Sudan, Haiti, Syria, Haiti, Syria, Venezuela, and all the nations where there's turmoil and unrest. Lord, we commit the situations of the pandemic to you. Let there be a permanent solution to this health crisis mm -hmm. and its associated disruptions to people's lives and families. Father, 
comfort all that have lost loved ones to this pandemic and other causes. Father, we thank you for children, families, and young people. We pray for conflict resolution among family members and peace in our homes. Help our young people to distinguish between good and evil. Help them to stick to what is good, honorable, and praiseworthy. We commit to you, O oh Lord, Christians all over the world. Help us to be fit for your purpose here on earth. Let your will be done in our lives. Help us to continue to be shining examples to people around us. Father, as we wait on you, bring hope to the hopeless. Make clear a path for justice. Guide us as we seek your kingdom and deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. So this is the Bible reading, although it's on a piece of paper, but I promise you it's the Word of God, the living Word of God, and it's taken um, from 1 Peter 1, from verse 3, and it's titled, Jesus, Our Hope. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready and revealed in the last time. Verse 6, in all this, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials, these have come so that the proven genuineness of, the, of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. For it is written in scriptures, be holy because I am holy. Show sincere love for each other deeply from the heart, for you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of the imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. This is God's word. May we thank him for it. Thank you, Juliana, and thank you, Dillis, for leading us this morning. It is so good to be here. I, I said before the service started, I'm delighted to be at this service and not amongst the young people and children who are in the forest having their church. I imagine it is pretty cold, but I have been informed that they will be having hot chocolate afterwards in the comfort of a home. So we are beginning uh, Advent. Today is the first Sunday in Advent. And I just, what I love about Advent is as we are doing it here in Tunbridge Wells, so this is happening throughout God's church, throughout the world, done in different ways, in different expressions. And just, just for the record, there is no authoritative way of doing Advent. 
So some will come from different traditions and have certain color candles, uh, depending which uh, stream you come from. And there's many different ways of doing it. Actually, Advent comes from the Latin word adventus, which means coming. And what we're doing is uh, talking about the coming of Jesus and his birth, uh, which we celebrate in, in the Western world on the 25th of December. But also, um, it is also about his second coming. And so we have those two lenses as we go forward. And I'd just like to chat a little bit about uh, what we're looking at today, the Jesus our living hope. This coming of Jesus didn't come out of the blue. It didn't come as a surprise and a, a, a God taking something off the shelf just to quickly happen because of the situation of the world. No, it was planned, predicted. It was very much part of what God wanted for his world. And so we have in Isaiah uh, 7:14 an example of it. The Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give you birth of a son and will call him Emmanuel. And of course, we know Emmanuel means God is with us. And so wherever we are, whatever our situation, whatever we're coming from, we have the reality that God is with us. God is with us. Can you receive that this morning? Can you receive it whenever you're watching online? That God is with us. And that's partly at the heart of Jesus' incarnation on earth. He is with us. He is in us, working through us. And so therefore, we can go forward in the week into, with confidence. And as he's with us, the whole purpose of, of, of uh, December the 25th and Christ coming into the world uh, and, and living and dwelling amongst us, the very specific purpose is very clearly seen in the Gospels. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Or put it another way in Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. So when we get all involved in Christmas and all that happens in our homes and in our schools and in society, let us keep the main thing the main thing. Christ's birth is about saving his world. And I'll say more about that in a moment. And so I, we've chosen the passage, which is the living hope, coming from 1 Peter 1. And I'm excited by that because I'm excited by, one, by Peter himself. Because I see a lot of hope when I see what happened with Peter. You know, you, when you, uh, Peter, my goodness, haven't we seen incredible spiritual growth and maturity in him in the scriptures? This guy grew up 2,000 years ago and only went to primary school. He didn't have a secondary school education. And around the age of 12 in the Jewish culture, you then become an adult. Uh, you start taking on responsibilities more than washing up in the home. Actually, for them, they started taking on responsibility of becoming fishermen for him. And he would have joined his, his family business of becoming a fisherman. And he came from a very rural, remote village called Capernaum on the Sea of Galilee in, in the north of Israel. And there he was in a very uh, ordinary situation. Yet, God through Jesus Christ, chose Peter and prophetically said, Simon, you will be Peter, the rock. God installed into Peter a very critical role of being one of the key foundations of the church of Jesus Christ as it stands today and chose Peter to write two books, one and two Peter. 
Of course, as so often happens with Jesus, when he gives, he sees ahead of how he wants to use us, but then he says you need to be equipped for the task. So for Peter, he went on a three years ministry and training program. And on this three years ministry training and program, it was their apprenticeship model. And at the end of the three years, and had all that time with Jesus and experience of what was going on, he denied Jesus three times before he was crucified. And we know the Easter story. That was in the April, but the Lord is quick to forgive. And those who've messed up, he's quick to forgive. And he says, I'm going to reinstate you. Yes, you, I know what I want to do with you. I know how I want to use you. But actually, you've messed up. You denied me. Can't be much worse than that, really. But I'm going to reinstate you. That was in the May. In June, we have Pentecost. And he was baptized. That means filled with the Holy Spirit. And he preached his first sermon. And now we fast forward to him being a leader in the church. And when he's writing this letter, he's speaking to the Christians in what we call today modern Turkey. They were suffering for their faith, and a few years later, after he wrote this letter, just a few years, he was martyred for his faith. I just love the story, a very human story of God using an ordinary person and got hold of him and said, you know what, I want to use you. And so Peter went and pursued. He started from a, a background that wasn't Christian. It was quite secular, although he still went to the synagogue in the local village. And he went from being an ordinary person, getting on with life. His main focus was fishing, enjoying his friends and being in the family to one who intentionally focused on loving and serving the Lord. And as I've said, who was prepared to take up his cross and follow Jesus. And so I want to say to you this morning, as we look at the living hope, there is hope for you and there's hope for me. I think I can say with confidence, everyone in this room has had more than primary school education. I think I can say in confidence, we have got the New Testament, and we're, we have read some of it, if not all of it, where they didn't have the New Testament. I can say with confidence that Peter only had three years with Jesus and then had to be thrown out of the boat and swim in deep water and either swam or he would have sank to go and, and to be a founder of the church of Jesus Christ in this world. And God is saying to us today, remember those folk of the past and look at who you are today. You've got education, you've got the word of God. You've got so much going for you. And like Peter, you have messed up and you will mess up. But he's very quick to forgive if we're sorry. And he's very quick to redeem and to reuse you and to reuse me. And I want to invite you coming into the season of hope that you will say, yes, Lord, I want to be used. Yes, Lord, I want to have my focus. I am prepared to do that which you've called me to, and I'm going to be focused and sharp like Peter. That's my prayer for us, for all of us to continue the race that God has called us to. And then he just comes into verse 3. Praise be to the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's just so infectious. And that's so common with it in the beginning of, you know, whether it's in there or you read in Corinth, Corinthians or Ephesians. Praise be to God. So excited. And it's a good way to start. To remember praising God for who he is and what he's done. Praise God, the Father of God. His great mercy. Why? Because he has given us new birth into a living hope. That living hope's not dead. It's not wishful human hope. There is a, that when it hits reality, it fades and disappears. No, this hope we're talking about is alive. It's dynamic. It's fresh. It's fruitful in the 21st century. 
And it's a hope that is certain, a firm conviction, where we have a confident expectation. And my goodness, with all the news on the pandemic and everything else that's going on around us, we need hope. We need a living hope. We need something bigger and longer and greater than the, well, the current situations that are going on in our world. And many of us have been doing the well-being course. We've got seven groups at the moment doing the well-being course. And in that well-being course, what's happening? We're learning that there needs to be a hope. <laughs> however messed up we are, however emotionally exhausted we are, however much we're struggling spiritually or financially or in our relationships, we need to have this living hope. Something above us wider than us and beyond us that we can receive. F.B. Myers puts this living hope as a link between our present and our future. This, uh, uh, the way I like to describe it, a living hope is a bit like, have you, have you ever driven at night? For those of you watching in Europe, we know night is very long in this country at the moment. <laughs> it starts at four o'clock, can you believe it? Because it's dark. And it goes on right through to seven o'clock. Uh, we're very, we mustn't be jealous of our Australian or our Southern Hemisphere people who've got daylight. <laughs> We've got long, dark periods. But as uh, I think it was Dillis who, who read earlier, and uh, if I can just remind, remind ourselves, the people walked in darkness but have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. And so we have this light, and this living hope is a light. And when you're driving down the dark road, especially in rural Kent, you have that confidence of the way forward, and there's darkness around us. But you know what? Yesterday, I was driving with my lights along one of our rural Kent loads, and lo and behold, a stag decided to visit the front of our car. And we lost the front part of our car. And we have lost our front fender, and we've lost our right side of, our, of that, and we had wires pouring out. But the lights kept shining. I don't know how it worked, but with everything hanging off and falling off, the lights kept shining so we could continue our journey and come into Tunbridge World. And it reminded me, the light keeps shining. Yes, like the stag, we will have obstacles. But as we have obstacles and as we have difficulties, what we still have is the light shining because it's eternal. And whatever you and I go through in life, you have that eternal light. And you can keep going. You will get battered. You will get bruised. This is what this passage is about, living in difficult times. But that light shines, and we have hope in that. You know, this hope is like an oxygen for our soul. When it dies and we don't have hope, something inside up curls up and dies inside us. And there's many people who are absolutely um, in a terrible state. But we have Christ and we have the living hope. The living hope which is founded on the resurrection of Jesus Christ who raised from the dead. And because of that, we have that insurance. As Clement of Alexander, the early church father, said, what this does, this resurrection, he has now turned all my sunsets into sunrises. I love that. Although I'm not an early morning person, I must admit, my sunrise starts later than some of your sunrises. But even in my late sunrises and the way that I function, I can wake up with a spring in my step. And I can go forward with joy and a living hope because Christ has risen from the dead. And because of that, he has the authority over death. He has authority over sin. He has authority over the darkness. He has authority over the pandemic. He has authority over the wars that are going on. Jesus came at Advent to take away our sins, even though he himself knew no sin. The reason he came was to destroy the work of the devil. Through Christ Jesus, he came to be our substitute, sacrifice, justification, and redemption. 
And so we can praise God with conviction, confidence, and assurance that our new birth, our Christian life, is our inheritance that we have already received. Verse 4. And just out of interest, if you've got your Bibles or your tablets, I would look at the scriptures because it's not coming up because there aren't PowerPoints this morning. So I would look in, on your tablets or your Bible. This inheritance died, an inheritance that can never perish, verse 4, spoil or die. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. This glorious inheritance can't be taken away from you. This inheritance is not only kept for the Christian, but the Christian is kept for the inheritance. This is different from the inheritance we receive on earth. As you're aware, I've lost both my parents in the last year. And so yesterday we're spending the day in Hove looking at uh, the family, and I put it in brackets, silver. And there are four children, so it has to be shared out graciously and generously and giving the other their preference in the right spirit. And I'm thankful for my parents, and I'm thankful for what I inherited. It's not the value of what it's inherited. It's the memories. It's the, it's the things from our childhood, things growing up that were very important to us, that for you would be meaningless, but for us is very important. But you know what? That silver is going to perish. It's really nice. And when you come next to our house, you might see all these funny things and think, where did we get them? I promise you, we didn't steal them off the back of a lorry. We've inherited them, so you'll be fine. You don't have to judge us for that. But it's only for a season. They will disappear. And what this scripture is saying so clearly is this inheritance is kept in heaven for us. We don't wait for our parents to die. We get our inheritance the moment we are born again of the Spirit of God. And so God has given you his inheritance as a son, as a daughter of him. And if you go on in that scripture, you've already received it, and you will be protected through faith, uh, through the faith, are, are shielded by God's power until his coming of salvation that is already revealed when you were born again and completely fulfilled at the last time. So the difference is the Bible inheritance, the moment you are born again, you become inherited by Jesus as a son and daughter of him. You're living in the reality of all the blessing he wants to give you. You're living in the reality of the word of God. You're living in the reality of the spirit of God being in you and for you. Therefore, if God can use Peter, God can use you if you're available and open to him, and I'm available and open to him. What happens when Jesus' second coming will see the full understanding of salvation. You have been saved in the past, you continue to be saved, and you will continue to be saved. And he says he will protect you. And this is not the only reason, but part of the reasons why, from our perspective, and there are different perspectives within the church, in the Christian family, that... I, this salvation is really hard to lose. When God inherits and gives you a son and a daughter, it's really hard to lose your salvation. I know there are different views on this. Uh, the, my interpreter scriptures, and if you have a different view, that's fine. But my, this is just another scripture with other scriptures that reaffirms once you're born again, filled with the Spirit of God, you are organically one with Christ. You're organically one with the family of God. You're part of the bride. Unless you deliberately, intentionally want to lose it and sever it, you will not. And this gives so much encouragement for us older people who, who've had children who came to faith as a child or as a teenager or at university no longer going on with the Lord. Just because they're no longer going on with the Lord doesn't mean that God has cut them off. A child of God is a child of God. I'm a father. I've got three children. However badly my children behave, of course my children are perfect. But let's just imagine that they weren't perfect. I wouldn't cut them off. 
Would I cut them off? They may have more of a refining time when it comes to heaven because we're going to have to give an account for the way we've lived life. And I'm not going to judge anyone because I'm going to have lots of burning and sorting out of stuff I've messed up in. But let's, this is why we're talking about the living hope this morning. We're talking about the living hope. And I want you to have hope, those of you who are older with children or grandchildren who've had a personal faith in Jesus Christ, even though they choose to be distracted into the things of the world, distracted into uh, lots of other things other than God, they are secure in him, in my understanding of the word of God. You can check that out for yourself. It is a refining time, but God will give us the strength. That's 69. I just want to close on this. So what do we need to do now? As we have this living hope, being born again of the Spirit of God, where we've received their inheritance as a son and a daughter, and therefore we can hold our heads up high. But he doesn't just inherit, we don't just inherit our adoption as a child of God, we inherit the spirit of God that gives us the ability to live the Christian life. So he says, you know, there's a couple of things I'd like you to do. First of all, set your hope on the grace, just set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus is revealed at a second coming. But this is what I want you to do, I want you to do two things. First of all, verse 16, be holy because I'm holy. So yes, you're adopted. Yes, you belong to me. And, and could you just reflect my character? Could you just show that you belong to my family? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Could you just reflect some of our characteristics? And that's what we see with uh, joy and peace and, and so forth. Could you start reflecting that? Could you continue to reflect that? That's what holiness is about. And so we have a choice. Do we want to reflect the holiness of God? And I invite you to do that. And then the second thing is, there's one thing reflecting the holiness of God, but then verse 22 he says, show sincere love for each other deeply from your heart. And, and, and whilst you reflect my character and live for me in a good and right way, could you just show love for those around you? I'd really love you to do that. And not the ones you like, I'm talking about the ones who cause you a headache. And those who make it difficult. Because remember, you have been born again. And, and you can live with confidence and assurance that, that being born again is not a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. May we be able to live it, to receive it, uh, and grasp it and go forward in his name. Amen. As a response, and, and the band will come up whilst I do this, I like to read from John 1, 14 to 16. This living hope. The word became human and made his dwelling among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who comes from the Father, full of grace and truth. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. And so I want to invite you and me and those online, I want to invite you to open up your hands if you're comfortable with that. I know we're British and that's not normally what we like. We don't like to be asked to do things. <laughs> Wear a mask, why? <laughs> open up our hands to the Lord, why? Because I want you to be in a position to receive. Today I want you invite to receive the grace upon grace from Christ's fullness. He became human to be like us and pursue you with his fullness. So his fullness therefore means it's accessible to you. But it's a divine fullness, it's an infinite fullness. And I want you to be blessed in every way with the fullness of God. And so just receive now God's grace, God's living hope, God's blessing. He wants to fill you. He wants to anoint you. He wants to come into your relationships. He wants to come into your well-being. He wants to come into your work. He wants to come into your school. He wants to come into the way that your mind thinks and how you make decisions. 
And he wants to bless you with all the fullness of his grace. May you now, wherever you are, receive the fullness of his grace. Receive the fullness in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand together and sing this wonderful Advent hymn, Joy to the World, and just sing of the wonders of his love and look forward to that day we see him again. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. One more time. And heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing. pray for you that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through the spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide how long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measures of all the fullness of God. So now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than you can even ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout every generation and in every part of the world forever and ever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for coming. Goodbye to those who are online. And may you have a blessed week. Bye-bye.